Okay, let's move on to Ilya's talk. Um, so I'm very pleased uh, uh, to welcome uh, Ilya to give a talk here. I think I met Ilya in about 2016 uh, in Aarhus. At the time, we were both working on concurrent separation logic in Quark, and we exchanged uh, many interesting ideas then. Uh, since then, I've seen Ilya at uh, many conferences in many places, and um, he has been working on many different topics since then, smart contracts, distributed systems, program synthesis. He has uh, received uh, uh, various distinguished paper awards, received the Dal Nygaard Junior Prize, been program chair of ESOP. Um, but despite all these great achievements, Ilya still remains to be a great person and always enjoy talking to him. So I'm very much looking forward to his talk. Also keep in mind, Ilya is uh, looking for PhD students and postdocs according to his website. So if you're, if you're interested in what he's talking about, don't hesitate to, hesitate to send him a message and get in touch. Ilya, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. Uh, and uh, thanks again for inviting me to give a talk at PLMW. This is uh, probably one of my most favorite events at every ACM SIGPLAN conference. So uh, Christine, uh, Stephanie, and Paul, many thanks uh, to, okay, let me share my entire screen. Hopefully that is going to work. And after that, we will talk about program synthesis. Okay. Uh, All right. Okay. Now we have my screen shared and let's move on. So I will try to switch between slides and I will try to do some live demo and hopefully it will be all fine. All right. Let's go. All right. Let's talk about program synthesis. So if you are at PLMW, which you are, and you are paying attention to what is happening in uh, programming language, you can probably notice that program synthesis is a pretty hot topic nowadays. Uh, and it's quite natural because it seems like a very next stage after just writing programs is to make computers write our programs for us. And uh, program synthesis as an area has uh, made quite a lot of impact actually in the life of people who don't even deal with writing programs every day. And all of you probably are familiar with one of the most famous success stories, which is Flashville, which many of you might have used just with this week to facilitate manipulation with Excel spreadsheets. So this is a famous work by Samit Gulmani and his quarters. And surprisingly, with all this impact to the lives of people who don't write programs, uh, there was uh, probably not as much impact on the life of the programmers until recently. So what happened recently is the machine learning and artificial intelligence came to help program synthesis in so-called uh, neurosymbolic program synthesis. And that was a large success story of the tool known as GitHub Copilot that came out just earlier this the summer last year. And I was super excited to try it. So like when I got my hands on it, I immediately started to try uh, synthesize some code. And at this point, actually, let me just share some experience of working with GitHub Copilot, which I think is a fantastic tool. And if you have never tried it, I strongly suggest you do it. So I hope you can see my VS code now. And I'm actually going to see if GitHub Copilot can uh, help to synthesize a common question at the basic interviews for a C programmer. So here we have a data structure of single link list. We have a utility function that creates a list of a given length from a given array of integers. So that's all pretty standard. So this is something that I defined. And there is also a couple of utility functions for printing the list from the pointer to its head and also printing a couple of lists, assuming that one is a copy of another one. Really nothing particularly fancy here. Uh, a function that I will skip and I'm going to synthesize. And finally, the function that uh, we use for testing. So the main method just creates a list, a list from a, a five element array, uh, takes a copy of, it, of its head pointer and then runs the list copy. So the list copy is a function that I would like to implement or better synthesize. And it's kind of uh, curious in nature. So instead of returning the pointer just for the fun of, it, fun of it, I'm going to ask uh, for a pointer to the list. And then I'm going to assign the uh, pointer to the duplicate of the list to this pointer. Okay. So let's write some code or let's try to synthesize some code. So the funny thing about the copilot is you never know what actually comes out. So what I've tried five minutes ago might not be what we will get now, which makes it even more fun. Okay, I think we can agree this is very impressive. So the program just keeps suggesting the code. Oh, wow. Okay, that's truly something. And yeah, anything else? 
No, it seems like we're done. So the tool actually parsed my comments in English and wrote this text. And uh, well, I can only stand here and all. And well, the one thing I can do is actually run this program. So let's compile that. Yeah, there's everything the truth. And now I'm going to run this. And remember, we are taking the copy of the list and we want to print it and it's copy. And now we are printing it. And we see something interesting. So in fact, it did make a copy, but this may be not exactly the copy that we want. Now let's go back and read this code. Well, you can see that uh, by synthesizing the code, uh, which has been inspired probably by many implementations on GitHub, uh, well, GitHub Copilot committed a rookie mistake. So it appended the elements to the list in the reverse order. Uh, to be perfectly clear, maybe that was the flow in my specification. So I cannot be sure. And in fact, if I just slightly change it, maybe it will be able to synthesize the right code. The problem is that I will still need to rerun the test. And when the code does not do what, I, what it's supposed to do, I will have to go back and read the code. And this is the state of the art, which, uh, as impressive as it is, does leave some room for improvement if we really do care that the code that the GitHub Copilot gave to us actually does what it's supposed to do. And at this point, let me just switch back to the topic of my talk, which is about building trust in the results of our synthesis. So how can we build trust? Well, first of all, we are going to switch from English, which is uh, not a very formal mean to specify our intention, to a more formal uh, way to do that using so-called program logic. And now instead of saying copy the list and return the copy uh, in this new pointer, I'm going to write the same thing, but using even more concise formalism of the program logic known as separation logic. So here I'm going to uh, specify my intent by giving a pre and the post condition of the function that is to be generated. So the precondition says, well, here's the pointer and it points to an address X, which actually happens to be the head of the single link list, which is inductively defined uh, data structure. I will show the definition on the next slide. Uh, at the end, I'm going to get back the copy of the, the, actually the instance of the very same list in my memory. And separately from it, uh, there are going to be another list pointed by another memory allocation Y. And this is exactly what R is going to point at the end. And uh, you might or not might not be familiar with separation logic, which is a great formalism for specifying data uh, structures that are located in memory. And now I'm very happy uh, to give this talk after Honsok, who is actually one of the co-inventors of this formalism, which has been remarkably influential in academia and industry. There are probably six separation logic papers just at this popo. Regardless, so we are just using separation logic as our way to specify our intention. And it's actually very concise. Like, never mind the fact that we once we need to specify what it means for a heap to form a single link list. And the definition, actually, if you kind of look at this from the perspective of a functional programmer, it's very similar to how you would specify a list in a language like Haskell. So there is an empty list, which occupies no memory, and its head is a null pointer. Or there is a non-empty case, in which case you have some payload pointed by the head, and the next pointer after it points to the tail, and then the whole thing repeats recursively. So again, if you're familiar with lists defined in the functional languages like Haskell and Ocomel, this is actually not something new for you. And now that Essentially, we're done. So after we have the specification, we can give it to a tool that I will name in a couple of slides. And voila, automatically, you get to produce this program. So what's exactly the magic here? So how this program came to be? Did it uh, Was it inspired by some code that someone has written? Actually, no. This is absolutely original program that our tool has generated from this logical specification. So let me talk about the guts of this approach and how exactly program synthesis based on separation logic works. So the nice thing about this way to synthesize program is that it works deductively by means of piggybacking on the logical inference. So here we are asking, is there the program that can take a state so, um, described by the predicate P and transform it to a state to the memory satisfied by the predicate Q. And P and Q are just your regular pre and post conditions of the function, except the function itself is missing and that function needs to be generated. So I'm going to call this pair of the pre and post condition a goal. And our goal is to find a program that transforms P into the Q. So the method for that actually is going to be very familiar to those who have some experience with proven uh, theorems in interactive tools, such as Isabel or the Koch Proof Assistant. And the method of finding the program is going to be automated enumerative proof search in rules for certain program logic. And coincidentally, as a byproduct, we will get a program, but also a proof 
that this program is correct and indeed satisfies this synthesis specification in the form of a pre and the post condition. So the formalism that my co-authors and myself developed based on the separation logic that enables synthesis is called synthetic separation logic. And here essentially what it is in a nutshell. So this is uh, some, this is the familiar um, statement in synthetic separation logic. And the formal meaning of it is that if that we should find the program C that using some variables from the context gamma, such that any initial state satisfying P, this program, after it terminates, and we only are going to get uh, generate strictly terminating programs, uh, that state will be transformed to a state satisfying Q. So again, this is actually very similar to the standard definition of core style correctness of program specified by means of pre and post conditions. So let's actually see some rules of the logic and see how they exactly give us the synthesis engine. So here is the most trivial rule saying, take the memory like take the state where no memory has been allocated and just return the same state and indeed there is not that much to do here so this is a terminal uh, rule and the program that uh, satisfies it just does nothing but this is a basic building block and it's important to have it. let's see what else can we have well imagine that we actually do have a pointer in our memory and it posts into some uh, it, it points to some logical or ghost variable a okay so since it's a logical variable it would be nice to turn it into a program variable so one thing that we can do is to say well you know we can actually synthesize the program that starts by reading from the location x and assigning it to a variable y and then proceeds whatever needs to be done to deal with the rest of our precondition uh, p to transform it into the post condition q so again if you're familiar with the horrell style verification you can recognize that this is actually very similar to the rule for verifying the read command in an imperative program similarly if we actually do have a memory location and we want to make sure that at the end it gets certain value well this value can be just written to this location. And this is a rule that synthesized the right. Okay, I think I can hear some echo. All right, fine. Someone's mic is not muted. Okay, hopefully it's fine now. Okay, finally, this is probably the most important rule. This is what uh, makes separation logic so uh, popular and so scalable. In fact, if we already have certain memory satisfying R, which appears both in the pre and post conditions, then effectively we don't need to do anything. So this memory is essentially just frames the interesting fragments P and Q that still need to be transformed. And uh, a very famous rule in separation logic called frame says, well, in this case, basically let's just focus on the P and Q part and R, we really don't need to do anything let's just remove it simultaneously from three and the post condition and you can see how this rule helps to cut our specification quite a bit and this is a rule that we'll be going to uh, going to use in order to make uh the synthesis uh, terminate but also this rule plays a really large role in program uh, verification based on separation logic so now these are four basic rules the final logics has more but these four are surprisingly already enough to synthesize some interesting programs so for example imagine that we want to synthesize something like a function that swaps values of the two pointers Again, not the most difficult problem program to write from scratch, but from the fun of it, we are going to give a declarative specification, saying starting from x that points to a and y points to b, and then swap these values a and b uh, without really telling what they are. So let's see how the syntactic separation logic helps to synthesize this problem. So this is our goal, and we have the variables x and y. So the first thing that we can do, and this is something that we have a rule that allows us to do, is to read from one of the pointers. Notice how the variable a in the precondition and the postcondition got replaced by a variable A2, which is no longer logical. It's a variable that is a part of our program. And as a byproduct, this rule actually emitted a read instruction. So we can continue and do the same thing with Y. And now we have two program level variables and no more logical variables left. Okay, now remember that we actually have a rule that allows us to uh, instantiate certain value in the post condition if we have uh, all that is required. Indeed. So this is a rule for writing. And now we can emit the write that assigns B2 to X. And notice how the post condition has changed now. Uh, and now we have X points to B2 both in precondition and x points to b2 in the post condition in the post condition so at this point we actually have the heap that uh, is already kind of in the right shape so we can just use the frame rule to cut this part of the specification that only leaves us with this part to uh, satisfy and indeed and indeed we can do the same trick by writing the value b2 to y and uh, that leaves us with another memory fragment, which is already the same in the pre and post condition. So we just use frame once again, which leaves us with the empty heap in the pre and the post condition, and we are done. So what exactly we have done? Well, 
we have proven that it's possible to transform a preconditional swap to the post condition. But what's even more important is that we have, uh, as a byproduct, we obtained a program that does exactly that. And now if we collect all the statements that have been emitted in the process of synthesizing that, then voila, we actually have our programs. And surprisingly, this approach can be extended to way more interesting uh, transformations of memory, including lists, trees, and your favorite uh, linked data structures located in memory. So this is what the deductive program synthesis does for heap manipulating programs and takes the initial specification. It looks for a proof. Well, sometimes uh, it might need to do the backtracking. So that was not the case in our example, but trust me, sometimes you actually might apply the wrong rule, which leads you nowhere. So you need to kind of unapply it and try again with a different rule. And, and at the end, it leaves you with a derivation trace, which essentially kind of records all the rules that you have applied in the process of getting your program. So this is something that you probably don't uh, want to read, but you can see that the trace is a tree here because it synthesizes two branches for the list copy, one for uh, the empty list and another for the non-empty list. And as a byproduct, we have a program. So that is a deductive synthesis for you. We have a tool that implements it. So the tool is called so slick, so which is this rodent, and it holds a separating conjunction, and it's a deductive synthesizer that uses the inference rules of synthetic separation logic and generates imperative heap manipulating programs. So this is a work that we have done three years ago. It got published at Popo, and we were really excited about it, but uh, then, uh, realize that there is actually one issue, one promise that we didn't fulfill. So we have implemented synthesizer, but is our synthesizer actually a correct implementation? So we are quite confident that we got the theory of the synthesis right. So in theory, this synthesizer would only generate correct programs with regard to the given logical specifications, but well, you know, tools are buggy. So in fact, uh, one of the implementations generated something like this. And again, I would suggest you to read the program on the right, but you, this talk is precisely about avoiding reading the program. So I'm just going to give away uh, the issue here and the issue that we forgot. So the synthesizer somehow had a bug and it didn't synthesize this assignment. So even though it gave us the program, this was not the program that satisfies our specification. So in this sense, we are no better than the AI powered tool that just spit out the code that you still need to read. So we still need to read this program. And this is something that we really wanted to fix. So how can we trust uh, the code that the synthesizer gives us? OK, so this is a talk about trust. And we built at Popple, we will trust using formal methods. And we want to have formal guarantees of correctness of our approach. So in the rest of this talk, I'm actually going to talk about how to formally guarantee the correctness of our synthesized program. And uh, we are going to do it by uh, producing mechanically checked proof certificates. And uh, the interesting part is that we actually almost already have everything to generate these certificates for the programs that we have synthesized. We just need to solve a couple of small technical issues. So what exactly we are going to do to generate cer uh, certificates? Well, we are going to shift the burden of the trust. See, the problem is that SUSLIC is a pretty large tool. It's uh, something close to 7,000 lines of Scala code. And uh, indeed, there are probably quite a few bugs there even now. So, But there are tools that are not to have very few bugs, like to the extent that people actually take the results as very serious uh, as certificates for something really correctness critical. And we all know those tools. One of those is the Coq Proof Assistant, which is a very popular tool in our community that has been shown to be remarkably useful for certifying critical components such as operating systems, compilers, and uh, other things. So Coq can uh, check that a certificate indeed is valid for a given specification. And Coq written in Okamo has a surprisingly small trusted code base to the extent that people actually uh, believe that uh, it's more or less bug free. So, OK, so what do we do? OK, one obvious solution is just to rewrite the entire SUSLIC and Coq. Uh, yeah, that's not great. So we really don't want to do that because there are actually quite a few of optimizations and uh, performance tricks in SUSLIC. Instead, uh, it turns out that SUSLIC actually already generates quite a lot of additional information when it synthesizes the program. So we can do what's called post hoc certification. So for each, instead of certifying a SUSLIC as a tool, as a program, each individual program that it synthesizes, we can derive a certificate for. And this idea is actually absolutely not normal. So this is the idea that has been made very popular by the concept of certifying compiler by George Nicola and Peter Lee. And you might know another paper by the same authors called proof carrying code. So when you actually have the compiler synthesizing the proof uh, that your code is correct. Well, that has been done for simple properties of programs that are being compiled, but that hasn't been done surprisingly for 
program synthesizer. So now we are going to fill this gap. So it seems like we already have all the ingredients and specifically the synthesis has produced the proof tree. So what's the big deal here? Now we need to take this uh, derivation from the synthesis and just somehow pretty print it to the proof in Coq and that will be our certificate so we can verify it. Well, and here comes the interesting technical change. Turns out that the way synthesis treats the formal specifications is actually quite different from how the state-of-the-art verification tools, such as those that Robert builds, uh, treat uh, specifications. And here's the difference. So in verification, uh, we take a lot of advantage uh, from the program structure. So verification, like when, verify, when you verify a program, you actually know what your program is. And what you can do is you basically just symbolically execute your program, modifying your precondition until you can logically deduce that your precondition entails or implies the post condition. And this is when you're done and you have verified your program. In synthesis, things are slightly more tricky because uh, as you could have seen, synthesis doesn't have a program to drive its structure. Instead, it transforms both pre and post conditions and emits the program as a byproduct. So since we cannot rely on the program structure, we are going to be slightly more creative in the way we treat the pre and post condition. And this is actually where fundamental discrepancy comes from. So specifically, we might have rules that transform the post condition in synthesis, but those rules cannot be applied immediately in verification. They need to be delayed. And that might not seem like a big deal, but actually it leads to a very very interesting way to implement the certifying procedure for the program synthesizer. So how do we bridge this gap? And uh, additionally to that, when we say verify the certificates, what exactly we are going to verify it with? Well, I say verify in Coq, but Coq as a tool is very general. And in fact, people have been used uh, using it as a base, uh, as, as a meta framework to build embeddings of separation logic, such as uh, whore type theory by Alex Nanevsky and his quarters, such as verified software toolchain by Andrew Appel, and such as Iris by uh, Ralph Young, Robert Prebers, Derek Dwyer, Lars Birkedal, and many others. So arguably the largest project uh, related to separation logic. So all those are very interesting implementations. So what if we want to support all of them? Because we don't want to have a preference toward one, towards one particular separation logic. Okay, let's see how to do that. Okay, so uh, how can we support all these verifiers uniformly? Well, it turns out that solution kind of is related to both of those. So uh, in order to bridge the gap between the verifiers and the synthesizers, so we need to find a way to somehow interpret the synthesis proof into the verification proof. And to do so uniformly, we actually need to make this interpreter such that it can be instantiated to all of these different verifiers. OK, so programming language research is about finding the right abstraction. So here we are going to show the abstraction for evaluating proofs from synthesis to verification. And this is done by the proof traversal that we have instantiated for three different backends. So let's talk about this verifier. So here, for the purpose of demonstration, I'm going to take the simplest implementation of the three, which is core type theory. And uh, I'm going to say that the interpretation of the synthesis proof into the verification proof is just a way to translate individual rule applications from um, synthesis to, let's say, core type theory. So basically, rewriting one tree into another one. And it doesn't really seem like a big deal. So basically, we just uh, map one node to another. And so when we start uh, by interpreting our synthesis tree, we run this interpreter through the, um, through the synthesis tree, and it gives us the cock proof. OK, so that would be too easy, right? So things actually start being interesting when we look at the interesting programs. Uh, so, And there are two sources of the discrepancy. First, not all the rules need to be applied in the same order. Some of them need to be delayed. And this is something that we can do using mechanisms that is very similar to continuations in functional programming. And second, we need to do something about the proof context, which might be different from the synthesis and for the verification. And we need to do some book commit for that. And this is something that we are going to, again, uh, steal an idea from functional programming and use the technique of accumulators for that. OK, let's just go through very briefly through these two challenges to see how interpreting proofs is actually quite fun. So here is a proof that we got out of synthesis, when, which is generated when it was producing our program. And here is the proof that we want to get in Coq. So this is kind of a prettified proof in whore type theory. OK, so things are nice and easy when we look at individual uh, rule applications in the proof on the left. Those we can translate pretty much syntactically into the applications for uh, of rules on the right. So here is the rule that produces the read instruction in a provably correct way. And here is the rule that verifies the read instruction on the right. OK, so we can just define 
define the effect of the interpreter like this. Okay, and it's kind of nice and easy while the proof are straightforward, but at some point we hit the rule that actually in the case of verification needs to be delayed. So this is the rule that manipulates with the post condition. And specifically, it makes sure that the list we have in the post condition is of one particular shape. And the synthesis uses this rule early on, but the verification needs to defer it. Okay, so now we need a way to delay the rule that works with the, pre uh, with the post condition. So instead of just interpreting the rules from synthesis to verification, we are going to add this extra component that defers applications of certain rules. And the way it's going to work is by whenever it encounters a rule that needs to be deferred, it just exits as uh, a lambda function that is going to be applied later. And when it reaches the end of the synthesis proof, it applies this lambda generating the missing steps in the verification proof. And if it sounds simple, actually uh, it is, but it's surprisingly what it needs to be done uh, in order to support, uh, support this discrepancy. Okay, so basically we need a mechanism to delay our uh, proof steps. Uh, additionally, uh, and this is where it gets slightly more technical, if we delay the steps, the context in which these steps have been generated might be actually different from the context in which we want to apply them. Specifically, they might want to, we might want to use them for different uh, variables. And for that, we kind of need to keep the state of the proof around. So, uh, so, and this state is something that changes when we perform a unification. So basically we rename some variables to another. So how do we keep track of all these renamings? Well, it turns out that it's actually very easy to keep track of that if we uh, pass the state explicitly. And this is, again, something that you do in functional programming when you write an interpreter that actually needs to keep some state around and then apply uh, the continuation to this step. So we have this proof context, which we keep populating every time some variables are being renamed. And at the end, when we unleash our deferred rules, we just plug this context in and we apply the delayed rules uh, using all these renamings in mind. Okay, so this is essentially the two tricks. Okay, so the two tricks from functional programming allows us to interpret the proofs from uh, synthesis to verification. And voila, as a result, we have our builder for certified program synthesis, which is interpreter, but it's not your usual interpreter. It's an interpreter on proofs rather than the interpreter on the programs. Okay, so let's see if I can get a super quick demo of how it works. So what the specifications in uh, synthesis look like? Okay, so this is what you as a user defined. So you also need to define what the predicate is, but uh, once you have done it, you can use it in multiple specifications. And here is your precondition, and here is your post condition. Now, if you run the tool, it takes a few seconds. Now, uh, let's see. So it's, it's, it's written in Scala, so it takes a couple of seconds to uh, fire the GVM. But once it's done, it produces the program. Let's see if it's going to happen now. Yeah, OK, so here's our program. And I do not suggest that you read this program, even though to my taste, it's actually pretty uh, readable. What's important is that actually it has generated a cock file. That is something that you actually might want to check out. And this is this cock file. Essentially, the only part that you need to read is this, which uh, paraphrases the specification from Suslik in terms of the logic, which in this case is or type theory. And you can notice that there are these list segments here and there. And here is the post condition where there is Y, there is list segment with Y. And there is a list segment with X. So with a little bit of training, you can actually read the specifications. And the key fact is that our implementation of list copy actually has this Howard type or specification. And there comes the proof. Is it the most ugly proof you are going to see today? Probably. But the nice thing that this proof is not something that one needs to write or not even something that one needs to read. This is just needs to be checked by Coq, which it will be done. And this is something that is done automatically. All right, now I have done uh, with demo. So there is a quite a number of practical concerns which I think I'm going to skip over in the interest of the questions and the discussions. So we have tried it with quite a number of programs. Uh, so including single link list, double link list trees. So you can see that uh, the specifications and the proofs, they are not large. So these are not the lines of codes. These are um, AST sizes. Uh, Check-in times. Sometimes, like most of the time, they are quite good. Uh, it's like actually quite surprising that in Coq it takes longer to check the program than it takes for us to synthesize it because we cut many corners and Coq is being very faithful. Uh, in VST, it's slightly longer because of the powerful automation, so kind of big hammer. Okay, so and uh, there are actually quite a few design choices that uh, you might want to check if you want to write your instantiation of uh, uh, our framework. So first of all, and this is something that I probably just gloss over, uh, the choice of the target logic heavily defines how easy it's going to be. And perhaps surprisingly, the logics which are probably have the least amount of uh, 
automation to make proofs uh, pleasant for the humans, uh, they are the most difficult to use as backend. So core types here, which has the least amount of automation, was the simplest one. So it's like the assembly of uh, separation logic. VST was substantially more difficult, but also for the fact that VST verifies the real C programs, not programs in made up imperative language. Iris, which is absolutely fantastic for writing handwritten proofs, turned out to be pretty difficult as a backend. And we tried to exercise an option of just uh, implementing our own version of separation logic um, on top of Iris, which is the synthesis friendly. And this is currently the work in progress. But the vanilla Iris uh, was actually very difficult to adopt because again, it works well for human written proofs, not that much for automated, automatically created proofs. So finally, one thing that I want to uh, um, emphasize is that whenever you hear about program synthesis, especially synthesis, uh, synthesis from logical assertions, inevitably you hear about using these really powerful tools called SMT solvers, which are really good answering questions whether x plus y is larger than z, given that x is larger than that and y is larger than that. So this is a trivial statement for a human, but uh, in order to solve it automatically, you need tools. And Z3 and CVC4 are popular SMT solvers. So synthesis only needs an answer yes, no from these tools. But uh, tools like Coke, they actually need a faithful proof that shows all the rules. And this is this was actually a serious gap for us to bridge, but luckily this community built fantastic tools exactly for this purpose called certified solvers, called hammers. And these are essentially very interesting tools that use um, a combination of machine learning with automatic theory improving in order to uh, restore most of the power of SMT, but in the context of proof assistance. And I'm going to give one reference here uh, that you are very much encouraged to read, but I also be, will be happy to share more. Okay, so essentially having the hammers, we only need to like write this proofs intros and hammer and this is it and it also enables even more interesting programs with the help of the hammers we actually managed to fully almost fully certi uh, certify tricky programs such as deleting the root from a binary search tree which is probably my least favorite example from the introductory class on data structures so here is actually something interesting uh, we didn't manage to fully solve all the logical assertions and this is where you can see the gap between the power of modern smt solvers which are fantastic and proof assistance which occasionally require a little bit of hand holding so out of let's say uh 15 facts uh, that arised in the implementation of a set of synthesized and sort six we couldn't prove automatically so we just proved them manually luckily they are not very complicated and this actually hints a very interesting research direction if we want to have certified program synthesis maybe we actually might want to have the human in the loop just to like provide a tiny amount of help to our certification just as a cherry on the top with regard to the correctness proof all right, so this is an overview of the state of the art in uh, certified program synthesis. Let me just summarize what we have seen. We have seen synthesis that not only produce the programs, but also produces machine check proofs of their correctness. And this is something we have done for imperative programs. And the key idea here is like, once you start thinking about your proofs as of objects that you can write an evaluator on and instantiate it differently, really cool things start happening. So if you want to have more details, we had a paper about this uh, last year. And uh, I really want to thank all my wonderful collaborators, especially Nadia Polikarpova, with whom we started this line of work, but also my collaborators from different universities and the students at NUS. So if you Google for Suslik separation logic, that's gonna be the first link in Google to see the tool. And uh, as a conclusion, let me just sketch some exciting future directions that this line of work brings us. So first of all, I want to acknowledge the fact that the world doesn't end with imperative programs. So we still have concurrency. We have really cool control effects such as event handlers, and we of other applications such as uh, probabilistic randomized programming. Can we apply other program logics uh, to synthesize those programs? What about quantum programs? Uh, what about combining deductive synthesis, which requires you to write the logical specification, and synthesis by example, which uh, requires you to write a slightly less verbose specifications, but give some examples. And finally, since machine learning is here and is not going anywhere, maybe we can also harness the, the, its power, not just finding the right programs as Copilot does, but also finding the right proofs our programs. And this is all I have. So thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take questions here. All right, this is it. Oh, and we have the video stream. I can see people clapping. This is exciting. <laughs> thank you very, for the very nice talk, Ilya. Um, so let's start with some questions. Um, I see there is, um, there are some online. Should um, I stop sharing my screen so you could display the questions or how is it going to work? 
students volunteers what is how is this supposed to work yeah i can read okay. the questions oh, oh, okay please go ahead can you uh, promote uh, the question the, uh, one question there are many ways to write a specification can you explain what is the advantage of separation logic over other form of specification how scalable is SUSLIC to large specification and implementations? Very well. Okay. So great question. Thank you so much for this. So the uh, usual, I mean, this is like by far the most popular question that uh, we get about the work on program synthesis. So uh, how do you write the specifications and how easy is it to write specification, especially if you want to synthesize something large? So uh, let me answer to the first question first. So the advantage of separation logic that this is the formalism that makes it relatively straightforward to write specifications of programs that have to do with manipulating with uh, data that resembles trees and also that uh, has to do with uh, modifying memory layouts. And it just turns out to be a really great fit to uh, specify uh, programs like what we had, manipulating with lists and trees. So uh, if you can imagine a different, for, I mean, obviously there might be different formalisms, but separation logic, it has this really, really nice and polished proof theory, which dozens of really clever people have developed over the last two decades since Honsok and company have discovered that. Uh, and well, it was kind of very pleasant to turn into the synthesis just by piggybacking on those ideas of writing verification proofs. So now we can do the synthesis proofs. So second, how scalable is SUSLIP to large specifications? Well, okay, so it depends on what you mean by large specifications. You can make it very precise, and then the tool probably will give you something useful. But large implementation, I'm not sure what is actually meant here because, well, the code is actually synthesized. So uh, the intended mode of operation is that you might want to have like this need function that you know how to specify precisely, but you really don't want to write them because you can make a mistake. So the list copy is a good example of those. I would say this is a sweet spot that this synthesizer occupies. So thanks for the question. OK, do we have a question uh, from the audience? Uh, so thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is, uh, so you talked a lot about uh, proving that it matches the specification correctly, but how do you know that the specification itself is correct? Right. Okay. Great question. So uh, how do you know that the specification is correct? So this is actually something that one has to trust. So the specification is the ultimate measure of correctness. And the example that I really like to give to my uh, students is that synthesizer is like an evil genie. So it will give you not what you want, but what you are asking for. So and if you wrote your specification in a way that is too loose or just like specify something different from your intention, well, the synthesis will give you that. And I will give you the proof that actually the program uh, uh, satisfies the specification, but this is really not something that you might need. So uh, reading specification very carefully or maybe testing it on some paper and pencil examples is essentially like how well that this is the only thing that we can do to validate our specification in the first place. But this is kind of the most, the most foundational thing. So how to specify your intent? And this is why this is such a good question. Our community has many answers about how to write specifications, but I don't think uh, any of them are at the level when we can just teach practitioners to do that. OK, thank you, Ilya. Um, since we run out quite a bit of time, uh, I'm going to uh, stop the session here. So let's all uh, give an applause for Ilya.